I'm going to have so much fun with this, though. You guys don't even know. I'm excited. I don't talk about this enough, I think. And that, when I was thinking and getting ready for this week, and uh, uh, this is a little bit of a detour from where I wanted to go, where, where I was planning on going, um, but, uh, but I think it's a good thing. As I was getting ready, I was like, man, we don't talk about this enough. If I think about like, the one thing, uh, like the, the number one thing that we are like too afraid to talk about in churches, it's money. And I figured out why. And so we're going to open up to Luke 20 uh, and start at verse 45 and then move on to 47. All the way through 47. I have the wrong version here. I have the right version here. There we go. Um, so Jesus is teaching in the temple towards the end of his ministry. How many know by the end of Jesus' ministry, he wasn't like, he wasn't the favorite of the Pharisees. They weren't like, you know what? Let's just call Jesus up. We'll have a really good discussion. He's going to make us look really good. Because by the end of Jesus' ministry, he'd like taken the Pharisees on enough times that they were like, we just, we're going to kill him. And that's ultimately what ended up happening. And so at this point in his life, they had been saying, let's kill this guy for a while. And so he had just gotten into another altercation with them in the temple. And uh, um, uh, this, this is kind of where this, the scene picks up. And it says, then with the crowds listening, so uh, Jesus not only, uh, you know, got in the face of the Pharisees, he did it nice and public. Uh, then with the crowds listening, he turned to the disciples and said, um, how, like, uh, so there's all these people around, and he turns to the disciples to teach the disciples something. And in one of these kind of moments where Jesus is like, I'm talking to these people, but it's for everybody to hear. You know what I mean? Like sometimes somebody will post something on your Facebook wall, they'll be like, this is for you, but it's on the wall, and then they tag a billion people in it. You're like, is this for me, or are you trying to make a point? You know what I mean? Uh, anyways, the crowd's listening. He turns to the disciples and said, beware of these teachers of religious law. And uh, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces. And how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head tables at the banquets. That's so many words on that screen. Yet, they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they will be severely punished. Say severely pun punished. That's intense. And uh, I think one of the reasons we're afraid of talking about money in the church is that these people didn't die and like they, they, those people died but like that that person that that archetype that uh, uh of that that religious scholar who goes on and on about how great he is and then steals widow's money is still a thing and so i'm just asking that today don't throw me in that camp i agree with you it's bad it happens all the time uh I mean, the stories are actually like heart-wrenching when you think about uh, some of the television preachers and some of the other people who, uh, um, even just some guys who use their position in the church to say, you need to give more money, and then they go, they go I don't know, buy a jet. I don't know. Um, I'll send you this cloth I prayed over that they didn't actually pray over. If you send me a lot of money, just kind of like is an intense thing to think about. And I, and I agree that that is absolutely horrible. And there is a big punishment coming from those guys, according to Jesus. I don't want that. But what I want for you is not also to be ruled, like I'm, I'm refusing to also be ruled by the fear of being labeled that way. Because if we never talk about our money, we're missing one of the major strongholds in, in like in our culture. Materialism, my idea of who I want to be, or like the things I want to buy and what I want to look at. And when I, when I walk into a room, what I want people to think of because of the clothes I'm wearing. Or like when I drive down the street, what I want people, like that weird thing that like I need the bigger house and the better thing. We talked about this a couple weeks ago a little bit um, where, we, where we're just like, no matter how big your, or good your thing is, there's always somebody who has a bigger or better thing. And like, so, th so it's like this never-ending end like hamster wheel and, and if we don't, like, address that, we're just all going to find ourselves on that. And what a waste of a life. Running and running and running, never finding, never getting where we're going. It's like, shoot. 
Maybe there's something more important than money, and there totally is, but it's so hard for us sometimes to wrap our minds around that. So what we're doing today is we're going like, to like adjust the way we see our finances and see that it's not, they're not the ends. We don't live for money. It's a means. We say it all the time. We're like, I don't have the means for that. I guess I don't, we don't say that so much anymore. Uh, but I've heard it said. <laughs> we don't have the means to do this. I don't have the means to buy. You know, like, it is a means. It's a means to an end. And we're going to talk about the appropriate end today. How about that? I'm not concerned with taking your money. I don't want it. I mean, I would take it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm concerned with presenting you holy. One of my jobs as I stand before God is to, is to say, when I sit before God and I'm like, God, after I preach a message and I pray about it, I'm like, how did that go? God, do, do I, did I hold back? Was there anything I should have said that I didn't say out of fear? That's like a one thing. And my, and my job with all of this, when I talk on Sundays or if I like sit down with you, my job as a pastor is to present you holy to God as best I can. Do everything in my power to present you holy before God. That's like, that's part of my responsibility as a leader in your life. And so when I, when I think about that, one of the things that I would hate to happen is for me to like do really well in all these things and then just have completely ignored this thing. That's very, very important to your heart. Not just your, it's your heart. Because at the end of the day, this isn't like a, a church finance issue. This is a heart issue. It's a trust issue. And so I want to get after it today. <clears throat> Please don't throw me in the category with the guys with the flowing robes. I don't wear one. I'm not, what, that was like, it's not that I have anything against guys that wear robes now. You know what I mean? Like, that was bad. I love, I love those, and I've got friends that wear robes. <laughs> I've got friends who wear all kind of robes. I got a, ba- there's a, The end of Luke 20. In the, in the uh, New King James says that these guys devour widows' houses. Just devour them, one after another. Sick, man. Anyway, next verse is Luke 21. It starts right here, and it's the parable of the widow with two mites. And it says, And one of these days, while Jesus was in the temple... He watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. For they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. God, thank you for our day today. Thank you for our time together. I pray you would just even open our hearts, unlock our hearts, and show us uh, more about who you are, um, even as we study um, some of our habits and our relationship with money. Thank you that the Bucks have won four out of five, and we are praying for more and more of that. In Jesus' name, would you double it? God, amen. I don't need to pray for the Packers. I just know that, 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 God, that, that God is on their team that's just going to be a, that's going to be a, is going to be a win today. In Jesus' name, I know it. I know it. I can feel it in my bones. I know there's some people here that aren't Packers fans. And uh, God will speak to you. I believe it. <laughs> you can still be saved. Anyway, I wonder, see, I never knew what it was like when the Packers were bad. I wonder if we were all just this arrogant and uh, when we were like, weren't any good. I don't know, but uh, we're really good. (laughs) Really good. So Jesus is in the temple all these days, and they're looking for ways to kill him. And one day, 
He walks back. Just imagine, like, after the service, I give this big thing, and I'm, like, mad at everybody, and everybody's, like, so feeling convicted. And I came back here, and I start to just watch this box, and I pull out my phone, and I start looking and watching all of the gifts as they're coming in, as you're texting them in, as you've gone to the website, and I'm just, like, watching and making, sh- like, watching everybody's giving, and then I just, like, make a comment. Pretend a little old widow comes in and drops two pennies in the back. And I'm like, stop the show. Just stop. Think about it. Everything else you guys gave was weak compared to this. And I'm like, we've read this story. We think about it. And if you say the widow's two mites, like everybody, this is one of those stories that like kind of transcends even biblical knowledge. Like everybody knows this story. But like think about how offended you would be if like after the service, I like, you, you turn in your like $2,000 check or your whatever, and I'm like, it's pretty weak compared to this two cents. Like what? Like, ah, uh, no. That's a lot of money, Jesus. I could buy a lot of stuff with that money, but I've chosen to give it. Isn't that awesome? Think about all the rich dudes that day who go in and turn in their, their big amounts of money, the sack of gold or whatever that they didn't need. It was a tiny portion of their surplus. Um, and I get to thinking about, about giving in, this, in, in kind of a, in, in a different light then. Like, maybe God didn't, doesn't need my check as much as I think he does. Like, maybe giving isn't about the amount, isn't about the check at all. Maybe it's about the way my heart is connected to that check. And if we look at our lives, our income as a pie, like, it's more about the part of the surplus or the part in general than it is about like how much the total pie is worth. Does that make sense? And so um, as we talk about this today, I want us to think about how we're doing in light of the scale that Jesus laid down with this woman. Here's a gift I really love. Jesus is saying. So if you're wondering like how God feels about giving, what percentage, how much, like all that stuff, here's what Jesus said. He's like, here's a gift I really, really love. Now he's not, this isn't prescriptive. Not, you're not supposed to give every two pennies you have. I don't, I'm not. But here's a gift I really, really love. Everything she had. And in a moment, we all completely understand what her value system is, where her trust is, and how she understands um, her uh, financial security. And in that same moment, we totally understand out of a tiny part of a surplus where other people, where all these other people um, get their financial security. Isn't that interesting? You can tell just because of how sh- much she gave and how much they gave, you can tell. And so um, uh, we were talking about this on, on Monday, and uh, Brian said th- this, and it's just really, it's true. Um, if you want to know where your heart is, go look at your, um, your, your, uh, the way you spend your time and the way you spend your money, because we have uh, two things in our lives. These two things are finite resources for us. We only get 24 hours a day, all of us. Except for once a year we get 23, and once a year we get 25. But it averages out, and every once in a while they'll add a leap second. (laughs) Uh, But for the most part, um, this is what happens when I'm around people that are too literal too often. I just have to cover all of my bases all the time. So uh, I'm sorry, and you're welcome. (laughs) What we have on average, 24 hours a day, all of us. We can't get more of that. No matter what. And uh, um, 
we all just have the money we have, meaning like we could all write a check right now that would empty our bank account. It's finite. It's not. I ha we have like infinite love. Like I don't have a, a limit to that resource. I could, I could be keep giving it. Just because I love um, uh, Christina all the way doesn't mean I can't love my family all the way as well. It's not like there's like I only have I only have a hundred love, and if, if I got to make sure I like dole that out right, you know. Like we can love and then love and then love. You can always love more. There's like, that's not, a, that's not an emptying reservoir. Um, money and time is. And uh, you can tell your value system by the way you use those. What's going on in your heart by the way you use those. And we just see the picture that's so clear here. Who does she trust? She trusts God. Who do they trust? They trust themselves. And why are they giving? Because it looks good. Let me just tell you, anything you're doing in your Christianity because it looks good, stop doing that. Or stop doing that for that reason. <laughs> Motivations matter to God. So much they matter to God. Especially in our giving. Especially in our giving. <clears throat> I think giving is fundamental to our Christian faith uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, and I want to just kind of put it in, in your heart where, where it belongs to me. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about, you know, what we do. Uh, just so you can kind of get, get some bearings here. Um, when, uh, when, I was, when, when we were just getting married, and I've heard a hundred preachers tell this story, and it's why we kind of did it this way. Um, uh, I, you know, you hear him say, when we got married, we started at 10%, and we just have like slowly cranked it up year after year after year. And I was like, well, I want to be, I want to have that story so I can preach that message. But that's not, I'll, that's not why. Chill. But uh, I was like, that sounds good to me, and so we've, we've done that. And uh, it's, uh, I would never, I, I, I don't even think about it. At the beginning of the month, um, I pay all of our bills for the month, and it all just happens at one time, so uh, we just pay everything at once, and then it's all kind of out of there, and in that are our two tithe checks. The money we get from the church, we tithe to another place. The money we get from not the church, we tithe to the church. Um, tithe means 10%, so when we tithe something, we give 10%. Uh, that's just what we we do. We've always done, and we support missionaries in Africa, one in North Dakota. We we and we we give, and then uh, on top of that, I don't, can't tell you how many times um, we just buy things for people or for the church, whatever. It just we just live this life of generosity, and and I hope that that is um, uh, not good good for you to hear. I just and 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 beyond that, just I think it's really normal for Christians. I've never. I don't feel like this super spiritual giving guy because I give 10%. Now, we get more than that, and I'm not, that's not my, I'm not here to tell you, like, oh, look how good I am at giving. I'm just saying, like, I don't, it's not in my heart, I'm not, like, super spiritual standing before you, this is, like, mega giant of generosity. I'm just, like, I'm just kind of doing the minimum here, in a, in a way. Um, and not that, um, uh, uh, that it would ever be discount, whatever. I just, I'm learning though that that's a really rare thing. For somebody, for to like, and to me, and, and this was on Monday when, when we were sitting down at our, at our senior meeting and we were having this discussion, I was like just like blown away as I was thinking about, wow, like we don't all do this. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't know what you guys make. I don't know what, I, and I don't, I'm not here to point out people. I just like, I want us to look at it and think about in light of what this woman gave and what everybody else gave and like in light of what we're giving and what, like, where's our trust? Who are we trusting at the end of the day? Like my ability to manage a budget or the or God of the universe, like, it ends up, and so, so I think it's fundamental. 
I really, really do think it's fundamental. Um, it, as fundamental as having a confident, consistent prayer life. As fundamental as having a life of worship to God. As fundamental as studying the Bible. Living in forgiveness. Loving others. Living in community. I think all those things are important. You can't do Christianity well long term without those things, in my opinion. As I read the Bible, I'm like, these are the prescriptions. We need to be giving ourselves to these. And in that list, I would put giving. A life of generosity. Why? Because we love money so much. What's the root of all evil? The love of money. Not all evil. Maybe. The love of money. Why do we have to give it? Because it teaches us not to love it. If you love it, let it go. That's just, I don't know. That just, that just connected. It didn't even make sense. I just said it. It felt good. Sometimes I ju- you just got to say it and see, you know? It wasn't true. That's not a true thing. We just love money so much. We do. We love to sit it in piles and bank accounts and watch it grow. We love to spend it. We love, I love to spend it. Christina loves to save it. It is hilarious. <laughs> we have an allowance. We both get, this is what we can spend every month on whatever we want to spend it on. And um, I'm seventh, eighth of the month, I'm usually like, all right, I got 20 bucks left. <laughs> Christina's is like months piling up. She's like, I'm thinking about buying a new car. I'm like, are you? S- <laughs> I mean, I got new shoes. She's not, she doesn't, she doesn't have that much money in there. Maybe like a, maybe like a scooter. She can probably get herself into like a nice used Honda scooter or something. And so when we think about, like, Christianity, I talked to some people, and, and some people very close to me that say they've tried Christianity and it didn't work. And so I wonder, like, what areas in our lives Christianity is like, we're like, ah, it just isn't working, my marriage, my whatever. And so I look at this list of things in general, I, I, and, and so if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm to sit down with you, you're like, I'm having this issue. I can't get along with my coworkers, my marriage, whatever. Uh, um, I will have a conversation f- with you, and what I will be looking for is these things, basically. I'm not going to, like, give me the checkbox answers, because if I, like, ask you, are you reading your Bible enough? Chances are you're going to say yes. And I'm like, okay, check, you know? But, like, but that's different. Like, you can read your Bible every day and not let the Bible read you. Amen? <laughs> Holla if you hear me. Um, <laughs> you can... Uh, um, you can have a prayer life, but never listen to God. And never like, you know what I mean? So I, yes, I have a prayer. But it's not a real connection with God. So there's like a lot of issues in this, that things that can go. And you can like give to the church without, being, without like giving. You know what I mean? Like we can write a check and kind of write it begrudgingly or whatever. And we just aren't living that life of generosity. And I would say that all of these things, like these are kind of like my diagnostic tools as we approach um, uh, individual. Even my own life. I'm like, okay, wow, that was an overreaction. I just, that was bad. Um, uh, what happened yesterday? Something happened Yes. Okay. I, it was very short overreaction, but it was real. We were picking up more leaves. And by more leaves, I mean 25 bags of leaves. <laughs> like, pressed down, shaken together, not, uh, running over. <laughs> 25 bags of leaves. That's a Bible joke. If you were a Bible giving joke, how apropos. I know French. Anyways, uh, and we have this chute. It's made out of this like whatever stuff. It's like weird plastic. It's cheap. And I needed it to dump the stuff in. And when I went to pick it up, I was like, that's a funnel part. The chute part was just not there. And so I looked at it, and I was like, I turned to Christina, I was like, did Piper do this? Piper's my five-month-old puppy. Did Piper do this? She's like, no, um, I think it broke off when we were trying to pick up some other leaves the other day. I said, 
I turned around. I didn't say anything. But in my mind, I was like, you think? <laughs> you think? If you have a detailed story, you don't think. You know. <laughs> like, I did that. <laughs> T- the way Tim's laughing makes me think that it was like they were partners in crime. <laughs> and now I needed to dump. And now I was picking these leaves up into the bag, and I had no way. And I was just like, ah. And I was an overreaction because I was, like, weirdly upset about it. These things cost, like, $7, but I was just like, <laughs> I was turning green and everything. <laughs> yeah. So I took that out of Christina's allowance. <laughs> she got plenty in there. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, anyway, it, was, it actually worked fine for what I needed it for that day. Um, and anyway, so it, I was just like, oh my gosh, here's the thing. And so those sorts of like overreactions, I'm like, whoa, what, what's going on here? What am, I, what am I missing? So I spent the rest of the day actually praying for Christina. I don't know if you've ever done this. If you're like mad at someone, you just start praying for them. And it was like, I, like, I was having like spiritual moments picking up these leaves. I wasn't actually planning to talk about this, but I really was. I was sitting there having uh, like, like, oh my gosh. Just like, just blessed by the, my ability just to be married to her, just love her. I mean, it just like, oh, I was like, oh, wow, this is, oh, so cool. And I just like, so by, I just like, he was picking up leaves all day, just like overwhelmed. That like, just like, just how, what marriage is, isn't that fun? And uh, just how little I actually know about her. I know more about her than anybody, and I know very little about her. And I just got like real excited just to learn, you know, more about her. And uh, so that was, there was a thing. I don't know. Where that, you're welcome. Uh, how about this? Thanks for listening. Uh, so you feel like maybe your Christianity is not working. Your, your walk is still to you're like, God, I feel you're so far away. I just, I've checked everything. I, don't, I can't figure it out. Like, check your giving. Where's your heart? Your generosity. Because if you're like marriage, you're like, oh, I don't know, we just feel selfish all the time. We're both just really selfish. It's like, are you giving enough? Because it's real easy to get self when you're selfish with your money, it's easy to get selfish with everything. There's an example of how this can like, this like, my, my like refusal of generosity starts to like affect things beyond just my checkbook. It happens all the time. Dave Ramsey, he is a, um, uh, he's like a get out of debt guy. He's like, He's cool. He's a Christian guy, but uh, but he doesn't uh, uh, but he doesn't teach his perspective from a Christian point of view. But one of the things he says is, if you want to get out of debt, the first thing you have to do is start giving ten percent anywhere. He's like, give it to your church, give it to a charity, whatever. Get ten percent of what comes in, get it out. And you're like, wait a second. I think I could get rid of debt way faster if I just pay, took that ten percent and started to pay it towards my credit cards. But Dave Ramsey says, no, that's not how it works, because you're human. You need to be giving in order to be smart with your money. Because otherwise, selfishness consumes us in the way we deal with our money, and we can't even make good decisions about it. I'm like, that's a really interesting thing, that God would also have us be doing something that Dave Ramsey thinks is a great idea, just for, like, like God knows something about human hearts. Because <laughs> he does. He's really smart. He's real smart. And he knows like, you very, very, very well. Very well. And so what he wants us for us isn't our money. He's like, I, whatever, I've got plenty. Like, the streets are made out of gold in heaven. So if he was like, I'm really short on something, you just take like a knife out to the street and just like <laughs> call 1-800-GOLD for sale now. Just drop it off. Get the check. He's fine. He's set. God said he doesn't need your money. But he wants your heart. And as long as your heart belongs to your money, he can't have it. He wants that for you, and it, you want that for you. Trust me, you want this for you. Uh, when we were first married, Christina started telling me that she believed we were going to get a $10,000 check in the mail. She just believed it. And I was like, cool. I'm like, have fun believing that. <laughs> I don't believe it. She would, like, check the mail every day. She would, like, literally be like, I th- I, maybe today was the day. And she would go and she would, like, check the mail. And she's like, dang, not today, maybe tomorrow. She like, she had faith in this. Uh, it was like 11 months into our marriage. And would you know it, we got a $10,000 check. 
Like, she could have been believing for any number. And we may have gotten that check, whether she was believing for it or not. But like 11 months before, she started praying for a check for $10,000. And she just knew she was going to get it. She's like, I heard God say it. We're going to get a check for $10,000. And she would just check the mail like it was coming. And then it happened. My wife is a giant in the faith. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just blessed that she had that faith and she believed for it. And, I'm not, and I don't know that, it's like, that like, had we not given what we'd given and whatever. Our first year of our marriage, just to be real honest, was not financially like we weren't overflowing, maybe, is the best way to put it. We were broke. Uh, there were days it would be like the fifth of the month, which was like the rent day, because like it was due on the first, but you had five days of grace day. I remember uh, twice that year waking up and being like, that's not going to happen. That is not, <laughs> that is not going to happen. And so I have a, uh, uh, like a little amount of money set aside that when there is no other money, we can go out to breakfast. So, um, so we did that. And we, you know, we, uh, you know, I beg and borrow, you know, my parents, whatever. We, we made it happen, but it was just like, what we didn't do in that time is stop giving. And, uh, like, I don't know if it's, I don't know. I just know that it was way more important to me that, like, God had control over my heart, my, my like, connection to money than he did than, um, than for me to be able to control my money. It was just more important to me. And I hope that, that it becomes more important to you. And I hope as we're, like, talking about this today, it's just beginning to set in on you that, like, my life doesn't revolve around my money. Even though it feels like it sometimes. You're like, I wake up in the morning, I go to work, and then I, so I can get money, so I can put food on the table, so I can do all these things. So like, really, without money, my whole life falls apart. Nick, yeah, probably it would. But like, way more important than money in your life is, is like the Lord in your life, and the Lord in your money. Um, I hope you can, is this working? Is this helpful? I just want you to kind of see how I think about money, and how I think Jesus talks about it, and how important it is. So I don't think like giving is the one pill that can fix everything in your life, but I, can, but I know that it's one of the things we should check, right? So your check engine light goes on, there's a few things you check right away, like your gas cap, and uh, some other things I'm sure you people check that check your check engine lights. Uh, um, right. Those things, you, like, this, here's, here's the thing you should check. When there's, like, an overreaction, or there's, like, uh, you're, like, feeling far from God, you're, like, I just haven't connected to God in a while. Here's a list of things to check. Are you forgiving? Are you, are you giving? It's one of those things on that list. Uh, for me, absolutely. Um, where's your generosity? Even, even when it comes to, like, you know, I feel like I never have enough money. I feel like I'm always behind. I feel like I never get there. And I'm, like, well, are you giving? I'm not saying it'll fix it. If you start giving, that's not up to me. But it's a good thing to start. It's a good place to start. And to be honest with you, any issue that pops up, there's probably a mix of things that will, that will help you. And giving, I would bet, is on that list most of the time. And it's not earning anything. We're not, like, earning God's approval. We're not earning God's, like, love for us. We're not earning money. So it's not like we give in order to get. That's not the thing. Um, but it's just putting your faith into work. Who do we trust? And if we trust who we say we trust, then we'll act like we trust him. And we'll do what he says. We'll act, we're like, okay. So we get down to, at the end of the day, this is an issue of obedience. And... Uh, Gosh, I have so much more to say, uh, so, but this is really fun. Isn't this fun? Uh, the myth at the end of the day is that we can create for ourselves security. At the end of the day, the myth that we have to like, push away, the filter, if you will, that we're looking through, that we have to shake, is this idea that like, we can create with our finances security for ourselves. And you're like, yeah, you can. You can build a big old 401k, and you can build a big savings account, and you can build a big um, uh, uh, retirement account, and you can actually get to the point, if you get enough money, that your money, that you make off of your money, pays for you to live. And you're like, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, but that doesn't help, actually, create security for you 
because we think if we create like financial safety all around us that we'll never get hit with anything in life. But the problem is that like financial safety is only a small part of our security. Not to say, not to mention, we don't know if the star- stock market is going to b- b- go belly up again or if uh, you get um, some sort of like sickness that takes your money and you have to pay uh, uh, all this like hospital bills and stuff. And I, I'm not like, I'm not saying that that's going to happen to anyone. I'm just saying that these are real things in life that like can come way past all the money we have. I get, um, I get phone calls to the church um, with story after story uh, of uh, a person who's like, I just, I just need some help. I was making this much a year. I got sick or I was making this much a year. I lost my job. I was just this, that, and that. Like we really can't create and secure for ourselves any kind of like future. And like we do the best we can to like insulate ourselves from those things, but there's things that are beyond all of our control that we can't have, we can't help. So any kind of like security we get like through our finances is ultimately, uh, is a little bit of a, like not real. It's like, it's like dead bolting your front door. Uh, at our house, we have a deadbolt on the front door, we have a lock on the back door, and like uh, another lock on the side door. We have like, so at night, or whenever I'm not home, uh, apparently, um, all those doors are locked. And that is enough for uh, my family and Tim to feel safe. When in reality, we have a glass screen door, we have a glass front door, we have a bunch of windows, and uh, our, like, our, the door to our side of our house, you can probably just kick it in if you want it. It's not like, it's not a strong door, you know? It's not like a metal door. So like, there, there, is there security there? I mean, like, there's a measure of security there, but like, if we were, if there, if there was somebody who wanted to like, come in, in the house, like, they're getting in the house. I, li- I like, um, when I go golfing, I leave my keys at home, and so, uh, not on purpose, because I'm not, I'm thinking about golfing and not coming into the house ever. I just want to stay golfing. I'm like, if I, why would I need my keys if I'm still golfing? Um, anyways, but we break, uh, so I break into, I probably broke into my house 10 times this summer. I'm not going to tell you how, but I probably did it. So it's not like, we're not creating like real security, we're creating a sense of security that makes us feel safe. And it's enough, like, if, if someone were going to like, we could like, there'd be, whatever. I'm not saying we're like in any danger because we only have locks. I'm not saying you need to like bump up the security on our house and like, that's not my point. What I'm saying is like, we're not insulated from all things. We're insulated from some things, but not all things. We can't create for ourselves a real sense of security, or, or a real, an honest security. But, the same is true with our finances as is true with my house. We can't create for ourselves a real security, or for ourselves a real uh, security. But, obedience brings that security. And I think about my dog when I think about this. Sometimes, when I'm like, Piper, come! What I want to do is protect her from something crazy that's about to happen. Whether it's um, uh, she's running out towards the street or whatever. Like, I want her here because here is safer than whatever's happening. Right? So I can cre- actually, like, in, in her obedience, I can be very, very safe for her. Right? Does that make some sense? Like, uh, like if she were to obey all the time, I can pretty much guarantee she really wouldn't get into that much, like, pain. There wouldn't be that much that would come to her. I can create that for her in, in a sense. Just track with me here. So one of the things our obedience does for us is it actually creates the security we're striving to create in all these other places. So as we, we count pennies and we try to make sure that we are like financially stable, we can't, could we, there's all those things, we, jobs, stock market, health, whatever, we can't control. God sees all of it, and he, can, and he can save us from it. He can cre- actually create security that's important to us. And I'm not saying that those things won't come to us, but I'm saying that God is in control even if they do. And that way more important than trusting me to get us through a thing like that is to trust God to get us through a thing like that. And the other thing, that may be when I'm like, Piper, come here. I have blessing for her. So in obedience, we find safety and blessing. I may have like a little treat that tastes like a pork liver. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> I mean, some days when we haven't gone grocery shopping for a little while, I'm like, meh, just kidding. Weird. <laughs> Weird. <sighs> Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I've never eaten a dog treat. I've never done that.
Like, I really haven't. Anyways, uh, there's security in obedience, but there's also blessing in obedience. So now I'm not saying, like, when we obey God with our finances, we give $10, we get $100 somewhere or whatever. I'm not, I've like, I've, I've lived as a Christian long enough to know that's not how it works. And some preachers will tell you that's exactly how it works. But I can tell you, because I'm alive, that that's not how that works. Um, but in obedience, there's incredible blessing. God has things for us that if we would be obedient, and this is just like across the board, for your marriage, for your, uh, for your in school, for your evangelism, your personal life, whatever, there's like God has blessing for us in obedience. And, and so sometimes we talk about this as like releasing the blessing. God released the blessing, but it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's more like, come here. <laughs> you listen, you get a treat. We're teaching Piper all sorts of tricks. Um, she does one where she sits down. She does one where she gives you like a high five with two paws. She does one where she like lays down. Tim has her doing this, um, uh, this shake thing, and that's cute. And um, we, she does... Uh, I have her doing, we, we say come up, and she gets up on two paws, and she kind of like, she can't bounce so well, so she kind of spins while she does it. It's pretty awkward um, looking, but uh, we're working on it, you know? Um, and uh, every time she obeys, she gets a treat. And uh, there's, um, there's a blessing in that for us, and, and, a, and a message for us to hear and for us to understand that like when, when God's asking us to do something, a, a lot of times it's just so he can bless us. A lot of times it's so we can learn more what he's like. And one of the areas I think we can be way more obedient in is, is our giving. Um, and uh, to kind of drive this point home, and that we wouldn't set the bar too low for ourselves, and, uh, and just kind of like start writing 10% checks and just be good with it. I want to I wanna show you a, pi a picture out of 2 Corinthians. We talked about a little bit during our series in Acts about the life of Paul. Um, the 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 7. It says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, he's writing to the Corinthian church about the church in Macedonia, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They're being tested by many troubles, and they're very poor but they're also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it all of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They did even more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged you, your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Uh, this church in Macedonia, in the, new, in the New King James, it says that they have gone through great trials and deep poverty. So I'm reading this this week and I'm like, shoot. Man, I could do better than this. And uh, I'm not looking at my life seeing great trials. I mean, there's trials. We all have that. But I'm certainly not seeing deep poverty. And what I'm not also seeing is like, like begging people to let me give to them. Isn't that nuts? Many trials, deep poverty. From that place, I'm thinking, okay, this is when the church rallies around this Macedonian church to get them out of their deep trials, or their deep poverty and their great trials. But the Macedonian church looked at it the other way. They're like, in the middle of all of this, we have great abundant joy. And uh, please, 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 let us give. 
to the church in Jerusalem as they were going under their, uh, their persecution. Please let us give. They begged him for the opportunity. So like, I think about my Christianity and the, even, even my, my like bent towards generosity. Am I like, please give me the opportunity to give money. I'm like, I don't think I'm there yet. Which leaves me short of the bar set in scripture. And that to me is like, ow! Oh! Because I think mostly, like as I think about my, my giving and our generosity as a family, I'm like, we do a really good job. But I read this this week and I was like, yeah, but we can do better. Because I so bad want my heart to be completely God's. I just think about that. Whatever you say, God, I'll do it. We can't get away from finances in this. We can't. Like, you can't give God everything except, no matter what you put at the end of that sentence, God gets it all. We're Christians. That's what that means. He gets it all. And I'm not saying empty your bank account into the church this morning. If God's saying that, I'm not getting in your way. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying take an honest look at the pattern of your life. Because here's the thing we, we often do with giving. We take an individual moment where, where we get like stirred up in our faith and we're like, you know what? I need to give. I need to give. And we give a lot in a moment. We have a little like giver's regret. And we're like, hmm. What I want us to do today is like maybe not give the big huge check today. Or that, that like guilt gift. But take a look at the pattern of our lives over the long term and adjust it to what God wants in our lives. Same thing with your time. We give our time. What do we give our time to? I found out this week, Tim showed me, there's this thing you can do on your phone to check how many hours you spent in so many apps over the last week. And I was embarrassed to look at it. There's time that we have that we can spend better. And I'm not saying like we need to, like, whatever. But it shows us where our values are, doesn't it? And the same thing that happens when we spend our money, it shows us what our values are. So like, what are our values? What are they actually? I know what we say they are. But when it comes down to it, is my money better in my hands or in God's hands? Ask them. Like, ask yourself, do I believe I'm smarter or God is smarter? And then it just adjust our lives long term to what that looks like. We'll change the way we spend our time long term. So when I look back at my life, so next week when I look at my phone, the Bible app will be on top. Or something like that. Because I want, I want it so bad. And I hope you do too. I hope that we can, like, that we're all standing here in this place like, you know what? God is better. God is smarter. He wants this for me. I want what he wants for me. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 8. Verse 8, the next verse here. This is something. I'm not commanding you to do this. This is Paul talking to this church. He's like, I'm not commanding you. But he's like, I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches. So we're all like, you know, well, let's not compare anything. Paul's like, I'm comparing some things. I'm comparing the amount that you give of, uh, compared to what you have uh, uh, and the amount that they give next to what they have. He's like, and I'm testing that, like, how genuine your love is. Isn't that crazy and wrong of Paul? <laughs> like, if it wasn't in the Bible, I'd be like, Nope. That can't, that can't be right. We're not supposed to compare. So I'm not, like, commanding anyone to do anything. I'm just saying, <laughs> there's a lot of people. Um, like, I don't, I don't want to, like, I don't want to just wash over this verse. I want to, like, let this hit us. Like, like, so God, so Paul, looking out and seeing, like, this is how I know how genuine your love is compared to what, how genuine 
their love is. That's an intense thing to think about too. I'm just like, ah, this is so intense. Paul, so intense. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 11. Now you should finish, this is just a couple verses later, what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Paul's saying this then, like, in this moment, hopefully, I would believe, in my heart even today, right now, like, my heart is like, I want to be more generous. I want to live before God, like, in this way that I can, like, that has more generosity. I want to give more. I want to sow more. See, I want to give more. Like, let that, don't let, let the eagerness you're showing right now be matched by your giving long term. That's why I don't want the big, I don't want, like, the big guilt gift. What I want is, like, you to look at your life and adjust it and say, okay, I'm going to trust God more. I'm going to give more. And what does that look like over the long term? Do that. Change your budget. Show it in the beginning. Be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. What do you want your life to look like? When I sit down and I, and I stop, shut the noise out, and I think about what I want to think about my life as I look back, and I, I, never, I don't want to be like, I wish I would have given more. I want to be somebody that's like, wow, I'm really pumped about the amount I was able to give. I have a dream in my heart. I don't know if this is ever going to happen. I have a dream in my heart that God would trust me to give away a million dollars from my own personal checking account. No idea how that's going to happen, but I pray for it. But I want to live like that's coming. I have no idea. I, none. How, if, when. But I believe, it. Like, I believe that that's a dream from God he put in my heart. But I'm not going to get to that spot ever by, um, by just waiting for God to mysteriously drop a million dollars in my bank account. There's this principle in the Bible, we get it all the time, is be faithful with little, and God will trust you with much. So we can't like, exceptional generosity doesn't start when you have exceptional means. It starts now, today, with the means you have. You're never going to grow to be a person of exception, except, exceptional generosity if you just like wait till you have like an exceptional amount to give. Because remember, it's not about the amount. What do you have? What are we giving? That's where I want to land. Let's stand up. Um, uh, there's a guy named Rick Warren. He's a pastor out in California, Lake Forest. He knows. Uh, he's written the, the best-selling not-the-Bible book ever. It's called Purpose Driven Life. He lives today in the same house. I mean, for a long time, he drove the same car. He paid back his church every cent of salary they ever paid him. He's planted churches in 153 nations, all because he wrote this book. He lives in the same house. He buys 10, I think he said $10 Walmart jeans. I'm not saying that needs to be your pattern, because you won't see me in $10 Walmart jeans. I don't pay that much more for my jeans. But he didn't just get to write that book. God didn't give him that kind of favor and and send that message through an entire generation. Because God was like, well, I hope he does the right stuff with it. I think God saw something in him. He knew he'd be able to, because of that book, put churches in like so many nations. That book is in so many languages. So I just like, when he was talking about this, I was just kind of overcome by this realization like, I mean, at the end of the day, that's his money. If he gives 10% of it, he can still do a lot of that stuff. And then he gets, then he gets to like live in whatever house and all this kind of stuff. But for Rick Warren, and I hope for me, perspective on life and stuff is different than it is for everybody else. Because I don't want to get to the end of my life and have a lot of stuff. Because you've heard this, maybe, you never see a hearse followed by a U-Haul. Because you can't take it with you. 
And I don't want to build all this stuff I can't take with me. I want to build his kingdom. I want to have his value system. Does that make some sense? Are you guys with me? Exceptional generosity doesn't start when you have exceptional means. It starts with the means you have now. Because God will give you what he could give you. And then as we're faithful with it, I believe God will trust us with more. God, we ask that you would help us readjust our hearts to your kingdom. That we wouldn't uh, anymore just grab our own cash with our own minds and try to take care of it all. But we would just trust you. That in obedience to you, we would find our security and we'd find our blessing. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We're going to um, close up here in just a minute. You have one of these. If you go online to the website, you can set up a recurring gift. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys have done this yet today. I know James talked about it. So as you, as you do this, like, if, if you're feeling like God says, write this much money, you, like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you don't do what God says. But what I don't want you to do is in our flesh just have this, like, guilt thing where we do it, then we have, like, the, the remorse, whatever. Uh, I want us to adjust our lives long term to becoming a people and a family full of generosity. Right? All right, amen.